Thank you all for being here. Um, I know that the week before Christmas break is kind of a, a tough time to think about health care reform, but uh, here we are. So before we get started, I want to thank Pascal Metrics for their very generous donation of the copies of Unaccountable by Dr. Marty McCary, who we have here today. Um, read Unaccountable, and read it not just because it's free. Read it because it's really good. I've spent a fair amount of time in hospitals, and um, Dr. Makari shocked me. So it's a very, very good book. It's worth, it's worth the read. So I'm Shannon Brownlee. I'm the acting director of health policy here at New America. I'm also a, um, an instructor at the Dartmouth Institute for Healthcare and Clinical Practice. And I've just recently become a senior fellow at the Lown Institute with my colleague, Dr. Vikas Sani, who we're lucky enough to have here today. Um, and the Lown Institute is going to be working on some of the cultural components of healthcare reform, which are crucially important. Um, so most of the debate over healthcare reform has focused on coverage until now. Um, that's the de debate that we went through during the first Obama administration, leading up to the passage of the, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I hope we won't have to revisit the question of coverage again. But I do have one comment. Only in America can possessing a gun be considered a right, and getting access to health and health care be considered a privilege. And until we see health and health care as rights, many of the reforms that we're going to talk about today may be very, very difficult to achieve. So the good news. The good news is that the conversation around health care has finally begun to expand to quality and safety. Americans are increasingly aware that the quality of the care they receive is not what it should be, especially considering how much we pay for it. Um, and they're getting a glimmer of understanding that hospitals are not necessarily very safe places to be. Dr. Macari's book, Unaccountable, is one of the most honest and clear windows on how hospitals really work, and I'm looking forward to his remarks today. But the next conversation in healthcare has to pry the lid off of produ productivity and efficiency. Um, an industry can't be productive until it is efficient, and healthcare is still in the dark ages when it comes to basic industrial efficiency. So, why has healthcare been so slow to analyze the impact of changes in organizations on improving output, output and lowering costs? And why has there been this been such a neglected theme in healthcare policy? Other, um, other sectors of the economy have streamlined their processes using, using systems like the Toyota production system, which helped make Toyota one of the most profitable, care, profitable car companies in the world. And Atul Gawande, who's a board member at the New America Foundation, his recent article in The New Yorker suggests that hospitals could learn a thing or two from the industrial processes of, yes, the Cheesecake Factory. So we need to start talking about this crucially important aspect of improving health care. But I want to leave you with a thought that we may have time to explore today or we may not, but it's something that we need to start thinking about very carefully. Um, the hospital industry is deeply in debt to the tune of about a trillion dollars in hospital bonds. It's equal to about a year's worth of their revenue. And most of that borrowing is going towards expanding capacity and has gone towards capacity in the past. More cath labs, more expensive CT scanners, more intensive care unit beds. But there's a day of reckoning coming, coming, and that day is when hospitals will have to justify this expansion, and it's coming soon. Because today, hospitals are facing an incredible challenge a perfect storm, if you will, of financial pressure, and it's coming from three different directions. Number one are public payments. Congress has been talking about controlling Medicare and Medicaid spending for decades, and they seem really serious now. As the federal budget becomes a more exclusive focus in Washington, doctors and hospitals are going to have a harder and harder time avoiding the cuts that everyone, even the military, has already started to feel. So those cuts have begun. Things like readmission penalties will start eating into hospital revenue. And on top of that, there are rumors that academic medical centers may see cuts in their payments for running residency programs. These are the training programs for young physicians. Um, and that may be part of the fiscal cliff deal. And if there are going to be other Medicare cuts in that deal, it's hard to imagine that some of them aren't going to affect hospitals. So private payers are stepping up. That's the second threat. Some of the big ones are now taking a much more active role in finding cheaper, better care. Walmart has a program called Centers of Excellence. 
Starting in January 1, over a million insured uh, Walmart employees and dependents will be able to get some complicated procedures like bariatric surgery at a few high-quality, low-cost institutions. The company will fly them out to the Mayo Clinic, Virginia Mason, and Scott and & White in Texas, fly them out, they have no co-payment, and the, hospital will, the, the company will end up saving money by sending them to these high-quality places. The third threat is that we're beginning to understand that getting the best care doesn't mean, mean spending lots of time in a high-tech cath lab or ICU unit. The best care keeps people out of the hospital in the first place. That's not to say that you don't need an ICU unit at times or that you don't need a stent at times. But in, one of the things that we're learning is that community-based care that keeps people out of the hospital ends up being better care. Um, and it means that people need social support they need to stay healthy. And that kind of care is happening in isolated pockets around the country. Jeff Brenner's work in Camden, New Jersey, for example, you may have read about his work in another Atul Gawande piece called The Hotspotters. It's happening at places like Group Health in Puget Sound, of Puget Sound in Washington State and Intermountain Health in Utah. And what these examples demonstrate is the power of better community care to produce better health and to keep patients out of the hospital. Now that's great for patients, it's great for payers, but keeping chronically ill patients out of the hospital means a huge source of revenue for the hospitals is drying up. These three sources of downward pressure on hospital revenue represent a triple threat. In the face of lower revenue, hospitals must become more efficient. Beyond that, some hospitals will have to shrink or close. We have too much excess supply in many parts of the country to keep running them at full capacity. Now, right-sizing the hospital industry is inevitable, but we do have a choice. We can see what's coming ahead and try to wind it down deliberately and intelligently, or we can let the market keep going until the music stops. And when that happens, some hospitals are going to fail. They'll be forced to shut their doors or radically reduce their services. And there are a lot of good reasons to avoid that latter option, catastrophic failure. Hospitals are huge local employers, and when they shut down, it's not good for communities, it's not good for jobs. Two, the bonds are held by somebody. The mortgage crisis is a pretty good dress rehearsal for what happens when a large sector of the economy starts to default on loan obligations all at once. And while there are major differences between the hospital bond market and the mortgage debt market, the consequences of frequent hospital defaults are difficult to predict and they are worth avoiding if possible. Finally, market-driven hospital failures are going to hit the most vulnerable hospitals first, and these are often the vitally important safety net hospitals, the public hospitals, or hospitals that are serving large Medicare and Medicaid populations. They can't run more patients through their cath lab to get more cash. And they are going to be squeezed as payments to hospitals are squeezed. So I want to leave you with, a, with an image. Um, last week I saw photos from a hospital in New York City, one of the major academic medical centers, and it was in the emergency room. And patients were sitting two to a bed in hallways. And these are not just poor patients, these are rich and poor alike are, being, um, are in this emergency room because the hospital doesn't really make money on this emergency room and so it hasn't invested in the emergency room. We need to pe keep people out of the emergency room if we possibly can, but if they need to be there, we need to make sure that it's run in a safe way, a high quality way as possible. So we have to start investing very differently. We have an ethical responsibility to protect people and we have an ethical responsibility, I think, to protect safety net hospitals. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, I'm very pleased to have Marty McCary, who is a surgeon and a health services researcher at Johns Hopkins and the author of Unaccountable, What Hospitals Won't Tell You and How Transparency Can Revolutionize Healthcare. He's sitting to my far right. He was active in the development of the surgical checklist, which many of you have probably heard of, and he's a regular medical commentator for CNN and Fox News. We hope C-SPAN won't hold that, that against him. Um, next is Congressman Jim Cooper, who's the U.S. Representative from Tennessee's 5th District, which encompasses Nashville, which is kind of the center of gravity for for-profit hospital industry. USA Today named Mr. Cooper, one of the brave 38 of a tiny band of heroes in Congress for his work on a bipartisan budget plan. Jim Cooper really knows health care, and he is bar none the smartest person up on the Hill when it comes to thinking about it from a legislative perspective. 
Dr. Vikas Sani is the president of the newly renamed Laun Institute in Boston. He's a practicing cardiologist with the Laun Group, a lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and a research associate in the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I'm very pleased to say that he's also my, um, my colleague in working together on this on the initiatives at the Laun Institute. And in April in 2012, we convened the Avoiding Avoidable Care Conference, where we gathered um, a group of clinicians to talk about the problem of overuse and overtreatment. And finally, last but not least, it's my pleasure to introduce Kavita Patel, who is a fellow and managing director of delivery system reform and clinical transformation at the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform at the Brookings Institution. Um, Kavita was here at the New America Foundation where she was a valued colleague and she is a practicing physician who has also worked in the White House and the Senate and she will serve as a respondent. So with that, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Shannon. It's quite an honor to be here. I consider Shannon to be a mentor, really. Her book, Overtreated, was one of the great uh, books that sort of define the, the status of the crisis. And uh, so I'm, I feel very honored here to be with all of these experts here. I'm just a simple country doctor, <laughs> blessed with many friends. <clears throat> and it's good to see some of those friends here. Uh, Leah Binder of the Leapfrog Group, uh, Drew Ladner and others. So thanks for coming. You know, in medical school, I remember learning what a nosebleed was. They said that it was uh, this term epistaxis, that is when you have a hemorrhage from your nasal region, you had epistaxis. And I remember raising my hand saying, isn't that the, the same as a nosebleed? <laughs> and they said, no, it's epistaxis. And I said, well, what's the difference between that and a nosebleed? And they said, nothing, it's exactly the same thing. Well, can we all agree collectively as a profession now to switch the name to nosebleed. And they said, it's epistaxis. <laughs> and I realized that there are these different orbits that are talking about the same thing in healthcare. So I was really bothered by this kind of language that almost made medicine seem like an aristocracy. I'd been well aware of the eroding public trust. You talk to patients that are frustrated with their health care. Um, you talk to my dad, who was an oncologist and practiced his whole career, just retired actually two months ago from Geisinger. But I remember talking to him and I said, you know, it, it doesn't seem like we're connecting anymore with the general public. It seems like there's a lot of distrust. Every five or ten years, the New England Journal of Medicine puts out a research study that about half of all the patients we see either don't follow our recommendations without us really knowing, and they're out there seeking alternative health care. And I thought, what a massive disconnect. We're prescribing these things. We think people are taking them. And um, I remember my dad said, write down your observations and just keep track of them, and you'll be amazed how when you look back on them, you'll have, have completely forgotten about some of these observations. And that, that's really the reason I wrote Unaccountable. I had these stories that I'd share going out to dinner with friends, and uh, they'd say, you know, you should write that down, put it in a book. And really, that's um, all the book is. It's just sharing firsthand some of these observations. But, you know, when you're a doctor and you have to become a patient, or you're a nurse and you have to become a patient, the healthcare system seems r completely different. It's almost as if you stepped outside of this world and you look back on it and you see this giant monster. And I remember when I had an issue with my knee in medical school and I was trying to, to get in with somebody who could tell me what was wrong with it, I felt I felt humiliated. I mean, I was being ping-ponged around from doctor to doctor. They didn't want to deal with me. I didn't fit one of the classic conditions in the book. Um, the x-rays really didn't show anything in it. It took a long time for me to find somebody who sat down, listened, did a good physical examination, and essentially told me my knee was going to be fine with certain types of physical therapy, and it would be okay for me to go on and choose surgery as a profession, I was worried about standing up. 
And then I asked, can I get a copy of my records? <laughs> <laughs> and I was pointed to another office. Poor doctor, he, he just didn't know how it worked. And this other doctor, this other um, office said, you have to go down to some basement where it was dark and spooky and cold and there was some little window, uh, sort of like a rundown bank teller window. And I remember asking for a copy of my records and you would have thought we needed to get an act of Congress passed, no offense. <laughs> but you would have thought it was a major uh, task. And I remember f when I went back to the floor and the nurse had a copy of the records there and I said, can I just photocopy that? She looked at me like, who are you? You know, trying to get a copy, you know, why would you want to do that? And I realized, you know, for, from the perspective of those of us delivering health care, it can seem like we're delivering state-of-the-art care that's doing amazing things. But from the perspective of a patient sometimes, the, f the field can appear to be a closed-door culture. And there's no villains, there's nobody who's saying, you're not allowed to have this. It's just we're all doing our little jobs. We're be doing what we're told to do, but we're, it's not very coordinated. And I asked a patient about a year ago when I was interested in this general subject of how do patients choose medical care, and I said, just for fun, I said, tell me why you chose to come to this hospital. And she said, because the parking is really good here. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, okay. And I asked the next patient in clinic that morning, I said, before we start, can I just ask, so why did you come to Johns Hopkins? Why did you choose this hospital? She says, well, my, my mom was born here. And I thought, okay. And then I asked somebody else, and they said, well, the parking at Mercy is really rough. And I thought, what is going on here? You know, we're hearing this is one-fifth of the U.S. economy. It's a free market, no matter what anybody says about it being a communist system or socialism. People choose where to go, and the hospitals want your business. And they put billboards up, and they um, have valet services at the lobby of the hospital. But what are people using to make their free market decisions in, in this space. And it turns out one-fifth of the U.S. economy is a free market that I really believe is dysfunctional. I mean, when you've got outcomes that are superior and patients telling, telling us, they're just coming here because the parking's easy, the competition is there, but it's at the wrong level. And now as a society, we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question and that question is, do we believe the public has a right to know about the quality of their hospital? And I think they do. For the first time ever, we've got ways to measure hospital performance. And it makes sense that that performance can be used as the level of competition for hospitals instead of parking and billboards. You know, for a long time, we haven't had good ways to measure hospital performance. As a matter of fact, many of us doctors have protested the idea of measuring performance because the metrics were so crude and they were not exact. And they would, in fact, punish many of us that take on high-risk cases or take on borderline cases that other doctors won't take on or take on patients that are obese or uh, from, come from a low socioeconomic status or patients that we know are going to have a tough time with follow-up and their outcomes are going to look bad. We guarded the public availability of data for a long time, and I was a part of that. But now we've got new metrics. The field of measuring quality has matured, and the doctors' groups have gotten together and created formulas to measure quality in ways that are fair and risk-adjusted. We've got cardiology professional associations saying the time from when you say, I'm having chest pain, to the time when you have an EKG is a marker of quality. The surgeons groups have come up with 
formulas to measure complication rates. And they're measuring complication rates. And it turns out at some hospitals, the complication rates are 400% that of other hospitals, all of which are good hospitals. So now we have a dilemma as a society based on, a, based on these advances in the last few years. Do we believe the public has a right to know the, about the quality of their hospitals? And I think they do. I think that we have had these metrics leaking out to the public through different websites and different avenues. State departments of health have put some of these metrics up. But if it's not easy to understand and readily available to the consumers, it hasn't had a big impact. And for the first time now, we're seeing hospitalsafetyscore.org, consumerreportshealth.com. We're seeing websites serve as sort of the master board for patients to look up the quality of their hospitals. And that's one of the great things we're seeing with Hospital Compare. So um, that's all I really had to share. I just want to say I'm really honored here to be with such great experts, um, and thank you for being here. I'm the one. Thank you. I'm the one who feels honored to be here because I'm a huge fan of Shannon's. Her book, Overtreated, is truly important. I hope everybody in America reads it. And now we have a new exciting fellow entrant in this field. Marty McCarty's book, Unaccountable, is amazing. I spotted it a couple months ago in Nashville. I've gotten everybody to read it that I can find, and I'm going to use it in my class at the Owen School of Management at Vanderbilt University this winter. The power of narrative cannot be uh, overestimated. You know, one person even said the plural of anecdote is policy. So these stories that Marty is telling and who wouldn't want him as their doctor? You know, to be fair and calm, intelligent, balanced, and also to understand the system of medicine. That's extraordinarily important, and more and more of our physicians need to be able to do that. Unfortunately, I have the job of talking to you a little bit from a policy perspective today, and that's not nearly as exciting, because I don't do kiss and tell or anything like that, but the policies we've got to work on are fundamentally to save Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And in order to save those programs, you must be for reform. Magical thinking doesn't save the programs. Political speeches don't save the programs. Chickening out doesn't save those programs. Unfortunately, in a political environment, normally we follow the path of least resistance. And that will mean that Social Security Disability Program will be out of money in 2016 in this presidential term. It means that Medicare Part A will be out of money in 2024, which is not that much further away. And Social Security itself will be out of money by 2033. Those are deadlines that we must start adjusting now to meet because these are such vast and important programs that it takes years to start heading in the right path. Now, there are many other programs that are important. They're not trust fund dependent as much, and they're harder for accountants to comprehend. But it's possible that those programs are actually in worse financial shape, especially in a weak economy, than the so-called trust fund programs. It's just we don't have the tools today to even measure those shortfalls as well. So this is an acute problem. Of course, most of my colleagues like to say, oh, it'll be OK, everything's fine. We love stories with happy endings. I do too. But I want Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid to have a happy ending. And I think the best way to do that is to tell the truth now and to start acting appropriately. The way I calculate it, every day that we wait on a solution costs us another $11 billion, billion with a B. So this is a shocking realization. The cost of our dithering could actually fix the problem. But because we're unable to confront reality, the problem grows worse. On the good news side, uh, although it's still politically controversial, there are many reforms in Obamacare, which, if properly implemented, can go a long way toward improving reforming the system. IPAB is a very important reform that needs to be properly implemented, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Um, comparative effectiveness, PCORI is another extraordinarily important thing. So many people think falsely that the FDA tells you what's worth buying. 
and it doesn't, it never has, it only tells you what's a poison or what's slightly better than a placebo, and that's not good enough to know what's worth buying. ACOs are important if properly implemented, and they're spreading nationwide. We do need teamwork in medicine, and I love to see doctor-led teamwork. There's so many other reforms. It's easy to malign the Cadillac tax, but how many people know that the government's third largest health program doesn't even have a name? At least the Cadillac tax starts getting at that problem. Exchanges, you know, there are so many elements of this bill that are important that they need to be properly implemented. Of course, the things that are fun, more fun to talk about, those are usually the cost enhancers, not the cost <laughs> minimizers. So uh, we have to work, work through the situation. I was just at a health conference last week when people said, oh, there's no cost control in Obamacare. Then they proceeded to trash all the elements that actually provide some cost control. The um, truth is we've got to somehow get health spending to, no one's really talking about cuts. Everybody's really talking about slowing the rate of growth. So let's be honest about that. And if we can slow the rate of growth to inflation plus 1%, which would be the dream of any other industry, we've solved like two-thirds of the problem. That shouldn't be that hard because healthcare has been growing at inflation plus 2.5%. So it's really just that small percent or two different so it makes a difference, but as Einstein once said, the most powerful force on Earth is not nuclear power, it's compound interest. And we've got to get these big, <laughs> these big numbers right. Let me mention two other categories of ideas that are not as much fun to mention. In fact, I get in political trouble by even breathing them, but it's important. My definition, favorite definition of leadership is expanding what can be talked about without embarrassment. But CBO put out a book in 2008 healthcare policy options that has this amazing list of scored, savable endeavors that politicians flee from. We deny that that book was ever published, don't want to read it, but these things need to be looked at and examined. Not that it's an exhaustive list, but it's a great uh, beginning point. Uh, some of these ideas were hinted at in Simpson Bowles, but it's also important to realize that other policy ideas, some of which are taboo, at least in certain political parties, such as premium support and I'm talking about premium support as suggested by Henry Aaron and Alice Rivlin. Actually, I happen to be Democrats. You know, ideas like this need to be examined before they're dismissed. Uh, the Ryan Wyden version to keep Medicare fee-for-service as an option should be more closely looked at than it has been. And one of the most exciting developments going on right now is built on the Dartmouth work of understanding uh, the delivery of quality care in America understanding senseless geographical variations. The Institute of Medicine itself has embarked on an amazing project right now, a blue ribbon panel, and there's great hope that it will provide some sense of geographical equity in this country, which we've never had before. But those are all still in more or less the tame category. Let me mention an even uh, wilder set of categories, and I'm gonna divide these into three, uh, legal, a lifestyle, and professional. But uh, many of us who, uh, focus on healthcare economics, think we need all-payer rate disclosure because the Medicare data is accessible, but hardly any other data it really is. We need transparency at all levels. It's kind of shocking that for years we didn't really even understand how PBMs made money or dialysis companies, major sectors of the industry like that. We probably need to amend the federal prompt pay law to curtail fraud. You know, it's great that the federal government's the fastest payer in the country but it also leads to um, uh, fraudulent payments sometimes. We probably need to update the definition of disability and Social Security disability because it hasn't been updated since the 1950s. You know, why has Congress neglected that for over half a century? Reducing cost plus reimbursement is a way to start getting things under control. Stopping the prevalent practice of Medicaid gaming. It's amazing how almost every state enjoys gaming the Medicaid system, not to benefit beneficiaries, but to raid the treasury. Uh, ending direct-to-consumer ads on television by pharmaceutical companies would help. That's only $5 billion a year. Reforming the FBHPP program, the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, to promote better competition would help. How many people know that Blue Cross Blue Shield has gotten a free billion dollars from the federal government every year since 1986? The blues and only the blues. Like, how is this fair? Uh, other things, uh, probably a new program for dual eligibles. FQHCs, federally qualified health uh, clinics, need reform. And now that we're approaching more universal coverage, how can you still justify the tax exemption 
for 85 percent of America's hospitals. You know, this is a taboo subject, but even a Senator Grassley is willing to think about it. In terms of lifestyle choices, um, obesity is a scourge. How about limiting food stamps to healthy foods? How about honest labeling of clothing sizes? How about if you take up two plane seats, you have to buy two tickets? How about actually spending tobacco settlement funds on smoking cessation? Today, only 2% of that money, that huge windfall, that public health windfall, is actually spent on its intended purpose. 98% is spent on other things. One of my favorites, TVs for kids. How about if it were powered by an exercycle? Then people would burn calories while they're watching <laughs> the programming. But in the professional realm, and I'm a big believer in doctors taking leadership here, I wish we could empower doctors to say no. Because sometimes that is very necessary in the clinical setting. I wish we could get specialty societies to really reduce abuses. You know, we haven't even gotten complete uh, implementation of the Pronovos checklist yet. We need sensible malpractice reform. We need a good Samaritan organ donor chain. You know, it's amazing what can be done by proper linking up of, of uh, donors and donees. Even becoming skilled users of medical uh, technology, uh, information systems. Many doctors have nurses to do all that. And getting good at that, the, whether it's an EMR or physician order entry, would be greatly helpful. Just simply reducing over-medication would be huge. I'm from one of the states that's one of the most over-medicated in the country, including on prescription narcotics. Why? So I think elected officials and public employees have a real chance here to lead, not just by talking about it, but by actually being the guinea pigs first. We are subject to Obamacare, of course, as we should be. Uh, that's a form of leadership, but an even greater form of leadership is saving these vital programs for future generations. Because the long term is not a long way away. The long term is now. The long term is solving the fiscal cliff problem. And every day we wait costs us another $11 billion. So thanks for letting me be here. Thank you. I also want to thank Shannon for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm a clinical cardiologist. I've been in practice and been seeing patients for over 20 years. And uh, though Marty stole my line, I actually am a country doctor. Uh, I was uh, in practice on Cape, Cape Cod, which once upon a time was the country, uh, in a community hospital and saw how things work uh, quite outside academic centers and other settings. And so this may be, this panel may be a little bit uh, like uh, several blind people all trying to describe the elephant. So I'm going to go at it from a very different angle. The first thing I want to key off is something that Shannon said about productivity. And I think there's this really a fundamental paradox, at least in healthcare, when it comes to productivity. The Toyota model of production really works if you're making widgets. And if you're in a hospital and you're making process or procedures, it is subject. It, you can apply those techniques, and hospitals are doing so. And I think that's all to the good, because any unnecessary fat in processes is worth removing. But the reality is, Marty told you a story that gets to the heart of what clinical medicine is like, which is finally he got to somebody who sat down, took some time, and with a history and a physical, figured out enough to get Marty to where he needed to be. Now that's extremely efficient, but in many ways in medicine, that takes more time, not less. So the real question is how do we parse time in the system? And how do we do it in a way that optimizes efficiency and productivity? But when we do that, we have to keep our eye on the ball. What are we producing? Are we producing procedures or are we producing health? And if we're producing health for our communities, for our workforce, you know, for our society, 
then in fact, what we have to be thinking about is how hospitals fit in that environment. And that's a very different frame of reference. So I think that's an important thing for all of us to keep in mind. Uh, that's sort of at the very high macro level. And at the very microscopic level, at the interaction between a doctor and patient in the exam room, exactly what Marty described, is the other sort of crucible, really, of how change could happen. And I think what I want to impart is a sense of the staggering opportunity, the really staggering opportunity that exists if we were really to change many things about how we practice medicine. I certainly agree that doctor-led reform is important and, in fact, necessary. But I also think that my profession has dropped the ball a little bit with regard to issues of stewardship and appropriateness. And I think that may be changing, and that's, I think, a very healthy and optimistic note to sound. Shannon mentioned the conference that she and I organized in Boston in April. But many of you may know the American Board of Internal Medicine has been uh, uh, pushing a, a campaign called Choosing Wisely, which has elements that I think can be expanded enormously. And I think the clinical community can do a lot to own some of the problems, especially the problems of unnecessary or inappropriate care. I'm a clinical cardiologist. I train with Bernard Lown, and for 40 years we've maintained there has been far too much bypass surgery or stenting to be justified on the basis of actual outcomes. And in the last five years, 10 years, we've finally started seeing clinical trial data. Talk about the need for PCORI and other kinds of research. We've finally seen the data that supports uh, some of what we've been saying. But not a day goes by when I don't encounter a patient who has been told they need a bypass. They haven't even had a stress test. Uh, you know, or, you know, patients who have no symptoms um, and have had an imaging study and don't quite understand the rationale and the path for moving forward, but they end up on an assembly line very much like any of us when we become patients in the system we have. So I want to put a plug in for a renewal of the doctor-patient relationship, as trite as that sounds, because I think in many ways, as I say, there's a lot of leverage. Estimates of the Institute of Medicine uh, from their work on uh, the waste in the system, article in, in uh, Journal of the American Medical Association by uh, Don Berwick. You know, the, the figures are staggering. They're in the two, three hundred billion dollars per year range. Now, getting from here to there is clearly scary and uh, a major challenge in terms of the transition. But if we were able to do that, I think a lot of the fiscal problems that we're facing that are causing such conflict actually uh, you know, have a chance of being solved with what we all want, which is better health care at less cost and the same outcomes. So I think that's important. In that regard, there are some moves, and I think we're beginning to see something. Some hospital systems are beginning to look at the community in which they operate and the level of community health. And there's interesting work emerging. Actually, I, I heard Tom Frieden on Friday, uh, head of the CDC, talking in Boston about some interesting uh, data that's emerging suggesting that if hospital systems can deploy the right IT and deploy the right interventions and invest in the right way, they can have impacts on things that public health people traditionally thought, you know, the medical care system can't do that. So that's also a cause for optimism. But the only, in my view, the only way that'll really get turbocharged is if accountable care organizations and hospital systems are truly held accountable, not just for the care of the people who walk in the door, but the care of 
their catchment areas or their communities. I know that sounds a little bit crazy, perhaps, but I think something like that would actually engender a change in thinking that we desperately need. I happen to agree with Shannon. We are we're probably have too many hospital beds based on you know, the kind of system that would really be a learning system that optimizes the value. Uh, and it's very much like base closings. Uh, you know, it's like Lake Wobegon. Everybody's community hospital is above average, and it's somebody else's that should close. But I think, you know, the horse is out of the barn on that one. I mean, one of the people involved in the Walmart uh, initiative that Shannon told you about when I mentioned, you know, uh, these people being sent to Mayo or Virginia Mason or elsewhere, that's going to have a significant impact on the local healthcare marketplace. And in some areas, community hospitals are really going to take a hit. And his response was, well, many of them really should just be outpatient clinics, don't you think? And I don't think the people there would agree, but I think we face a real challenge in, in navigating that. Maybe we need a base closing commission kind of an approach for hospitals. And then lastly, uh, I think there's good evidence in the public health literature that medical care uh, achieves good health outcomes for a portion of all the good health outcome that's out there that we could get. And much of the rest is really from non-medical care, and it's a lot has to do with prevention, it has to do with lifestyle, it has to do with how we organize transportation, how we organize food. I mean, I think everyone here gets that. But I do think that one big problem that we need to address or think about is that the ROI, the return on investment of those kinds of investments is very long. Now, Jim is going to laugh. Uh, I used to think that the ROI was so long that you couldn't really expect insurance companies to take on that kind of investment in prevention programs because our, our forces, labor force is so mobile, you know, they'd, lose their premium, they, they'd lose their premium paying customer before they'd reap the benefits of those investments. So I used to think, well, it ought to be the government because they have a long-term view. Well, I guess not. I mean, effectively, the view is the election cycle. So we have a problem as a society. How do we make those kinds of long-term investments? But we must. And if we do, then some of the payoff from prevention, which I know is, is disputed quite often, uh, some of the payoff from prevention can actually be realized, but it can't be realized in short-term short horizons. So I'll stop there. Well, I, I have uh, the most fortunate job where I get to react to everything, but I'm going to offer, by, by reacting, I actually want to try to blend a little bit of what's said and uh, also thank Shannon and acknowledge some other good friends in the room. Phil Longman is, I think, still in the room. Hopefully he's also written uh, one of the best books that I think should be on everyone's must-read list called Better Care Anywhere, and it, it chronicles and talks about the innovation and why the VA emerged as a system that had been kind of the care for the last resort to the most principal choice of care and one that I think sets the trends. And I did part of my training. So we seem pretty doctor heavy on this panel, I realized. Uh, and, and that's not intentional, but certainly speaks to, I think, the culture of medicine. And certainly, you know, I, I was often told, we all have our stories from medical school, um, I was often told that the most powerful thing I had was my pen, and now it's probably the enter key, although sometimes I'm like thumping on the keyboard because it drives me crazy with my electronic medical record. Uh, and I practice, in full disclosure, at Hopkins, but in Washington, D.C., which is a whole other conversation that I wanted to touch on with hospital-employed doctors. And I think that uh, it is still true, however, that we as physicians initiate so much of both over-treatment and then in many cases I often find myself in situations where I'm worried that I'm under-treating or under-diagnosing or not thinking, partly because of time pressures, partly because when patients come in, and especially these last couple of weeks I've been in clinic with coughs and colds, it's just so easy to treat with a Z pack. And everybody knows about the, every, everybody knows that this happens, yet I feel like we all go into our little 
with our white coats into our rooms and we practice this evil doing of overprescribing. And in turn, I am also underdiagnosing and not attending to many of the things that are driving some of the, the clinical care. So <laughs> from a clinical perspective, Marty's book, I think, opens up a very general audience to complex concepts in a way that's very approachable. And I think I think Mr. Cooper hits on how that causes a real kind of clarion call for policymakers to actually do something about it. So the more the public understands about how screwed up our healthcare system is, the more it's incumbent upon those of us who live and work in this town and feel like we represent people's interests, in, in certainly an elected official, but then those of us who focus on policy in our day-to-day -day lives, in a non-elected capacity, we're really stuck kind of holding the bag and going, well, now what do you do about it? We've got this trillion, multi-trillion dollar problem. What do we do about it? And I think Vikas and Shannon and Marty and, and Representative Cooper have certainly hit on a couple of points. And I'll, I wanted to weave in some of the clinical with the policy by highlighting some of the future trends. Uh, at Brookings, I spend a lot of my time working on accountable care organizations. And I have to tell you, at first, you know, several years ago when Elliot Fisher and Mark McClellan would talk about ACOs, I thought, what is this mythical creature, this ACO, this unicorn of delivery systems that's going to fix everything? Well, now we have ACOs. We have over 2 million beneficiaries in Medicare that are enrolled in accountable care organizations. And I've spent time in some of these organizations. And what's fascinating is when you talk to patients, they have no clue what you're talking about. They're like, they're like ACO, is that a nursing home? I do not want to be in the nursing home. <laughs> Is my doctor, and then the, the follow-up question is, is that in-network or out-network? Because if that's out-of-network, I have to pay more, and I don't want to pay more. So, so, so there is still a disconnect with how promising a delivery system reform can be. And the future trend is for everything to move towards something more accountable. The phrase accountable care and innovation in healthcare are the most often overused phrases. So I couldn't agree more as a future trend that it's in, even more incredibly important for the public to have a an, an deep understanding of what this means. And, and then I'll, I want to, so that's the first trend. The second trend is kind of telecare and telemedicine. This highlights a policy conundrum because as most people know, Medicare does not reimburse for telephonic or certain aspects of telemedicine. And that's still even with as much as was done in the Affordable Care Act and progress made, there are still some limitations on what we can do. And that causes people to default to telling patients, you know what, I need to see you in my office, which only drives up cost and causes a lot of unintended consequences. People are, one thing that's been fascinating as someone who worked in, in a Democratic administration was to see this initial wave of kind of vitriol and hate for health reform. But now that we've been a couple of years out, I have seen such a surge in the private sector and in entrepreneurialism and in many nonpartisan in, encounters around how much opportunity health reform has created to allow for that often overused phrase, innovation in healthcare but especially in aspects of getting care to patients in difficult settings. So things like ZocDoc, which, which is an online, I'm, I'm no money from these people. I should get some, I suppose, if I were smarter. <laughs> but things that are making appointments easier, they're now looking at how to pair that with quality data and then to add to that to try to steer you to doctors who are you know, supposed to be by metrics better for you. So that's a trend that will only continue. We're not going to see a reversal in that. And that's a good thing. But from a policy standpoint, we're going to have to kind of think about how to make our Medicare and then uh, ultimately also our Medicaid system, even though that's a federal state partnership, to be a little bit more responsive to some of these future trends. Cost shifting to consumers. Uh, my husband works for a Fortune 50 company, and there's actually serious conversations about high deductible health plans and purchasers. I see Leah's obviously probably sits in this centrally. There are many conversations now about how employers, especially large employers, can think about reducing costs. When they think about the spend in health care costs for their employees, wellness programs certainly have their place, and the Affordable Care Act put pieces of that 
possible for tax deductions, et cetera, to make that a more attractive incentive. But on top of that, there are bottom lines, quarterly reports, and investors who need to have returns on their shares. And we're starting to see at the Johns Hopkins system, the employee health plan has moved for the next year, has moved to a higher deductible plan and a tight network where if you, it used to be that if you saw someone in the Hopkins system, there was zero copay, and now they've implemented copayments for even providers within your own system. So this is just one of a series of trends while we're trying to bend the cost curve and do all these really amazing kind of design, redesigns of care, it still presents a huge challenge that I think is all the more for po kind of responsive policy making, but then responsible clinical leadership. And, and I can't say enough about that. Uh, and then there's so many things that are kind of, I've never met more medical students who were comfortable being employed and salaried. And I'm not here to tell you that that's a good or a bad thing, but I will tell you that uh, certainly the kind of the in my community practice with most of the physicians I'm the youngest in practice and I'm pretty far out of medical school and so most of the physicians in our practice uh, were purchased kind of lock stock and barrel and have all either calculated when they're going to retire to kind of just get to retirement and then get out of this system or they're trying to calculate how much income they can make and you know kids tuitions things like that but if you take a stock of like just people coming out of school or out of residency, you'll see the majority of them are one, very comfortable being employed and thus being salaried or having compensation done differently than in a productivity manner. And number two, they're much more comfortable with kind of not just electronics, they're much more comfortable with interacting with their patients in a very different modality than white coat in an office. And that's, I think that's a positive. I do worry, however, Given the kind of concerns that Shannon raised, which I share about hospitals needing to meet margins and deficits and where they see opportunities, as well as what I see every day just in the real world, which is that if you're purchasing and you're buying up a cardiology practice, you're buying up an orthopedics practice, you're buying up primary care physicians, there's certainly kind of an understanding about the referral pattern within those purchased doctors. And there is certainly whether, and, and certainly nobody's doing anything, I hope, illegal in this regard, because patients are free to go, as Marty mentioned, where they want. But the truth, every time I get asked, you know, doctor, I need to, I, I, or we agree that a person needs to see a specialist, they say to me, where would you say, you know, where should I go? I mean, it's then, they, they rarely come to me and say, here are the names of the people I want to see for my orthopedic surgery referral. They often look to me. And if I'm working within a system in which I am incentivized to keep people inside of that system, that may be a good thing. But if we're only promoting the same kind of over-treatment and avoid kind of unnecessary uh, procedures and putting them down that cardiology gauntlet without being thoughtful as to what that means, we could see potentially in the next generation of healthcare, we could see these perverse incentives crop up in a very different way than what we talk about right now in a fee-for-service setting. So I do think it's important to have a very transparent, uh, I couldn't agree more about transparency, kind of all payer rate setting, or at least having an honest conversation about how money changes hands and how private pay con contracts help to subsidize and offset uh, Medicaid and Medicare, which is all very real to most people in healthcare. And I think that it's books like Marty's, books like Shannon's, books like Phil's, who really bring this dialogue into a very general conversation that also intersects with education, labor, employment opportunities that is critical. So I look forward to any questions and hopefully can delve into more. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here and, and throw out the first question. So, um, Mr. Cooper, you said that you need to empower physicians to say no. I'd like to ask you and Dr. Sani to talk about that from the policymakers' perspective. Are there things that Congress can actually do that will empower clinicians to say no? And and when I say no, when when we say say no, what we really mean is how. Do, I think something broader than simply saying to the patient who comes and says, I want Celebrex or I want knee surgery, but more the ability to say 
this is what's really right for this patient, despite what my hospital may need me to do. Marty talks in the book a little bit about, um, about the hospital putting pressure on surgeons to do more procedures, because that's how the hospital makes money. Um, so so for, the, for the clinician to be able to, to, to still all the voices that are saying, give more, because you make more money, because your hospital makes more money, et cetera, but also when the patient comes to you. So if Mr. Cooper can talk about policy things, but first, I'd like Dr. Sani to talk about how the clinician does it, because you've been doing that for a long time at the Lown Group. Well, first of all, it's rare indeed that a patient comes and says, I want X. Um, you know, the heart of being a professional is to put your information and knowledge at the service of the other person. That's really what you're supposed to do. And in my experience, um, you know, I, I could get a patient to do practically anything if I said it right, you know. And, and we know exactly how that's done, sometimes for good and sometimes not. You have a widow maker. You are lucky you came now. Uh, we know how to fix this, you know. So <clears throat> I think at the heart it's a about how you actually engage the patient. So I'm going to turn it around a little and say we really do need to kind of revive and resuscitate th the patient and all this because I hate to say we're all going to be patients sometime and, and the kind of care we want for ourselves and our families is really what the system needs to, to deliver. Uh, and in that regard, I think one important thing is that the amount of hard, settled science in medicine is significant, but still less than 50%. I don't know. What would you say, Marty? Yeah. And that means there's a lot of care and a lot of decision-making that depends a lot on conjecture, opinion, experience, and preference. And I think, you know, there's a movement in the land uh, called shared decision making, and I hadn't actually heard of it, I'm sorry to say, until a few years ago. But in fact, it is the case that when you look at the pros and the cons, take time and ensure that the patient really understands the trade offs, it's really not that difficult for for patients to come to a conclusion. And what the data suggests, and I found this astounding, but um, Al Mulley from Dartmouth shows this slide, and what the data suggests is that if you take a country, take a region like Toronto, Ontario in Canada, where rates of bypass surgery are low, in the low, by American standards, they'd be in the lower third, let's say, and if you truly initiate a, a, a shared decision-making process where patients fully understand uh, what's involved, patient choice for bypass surgery drops off the graph. I like to joke that becomes the lown rate. And um, in fact, it is the case that quite often we oversell uh, the benefits and we under-emphasize or, or don't mention the potential harms. And I think a, as a caring profession, there's a imp good impulse there, which is, you know, we try not to scare people with outcomes that are small probability, but nevertheless real. But this is where, you know, we all need to get treated like adults and understand what the trade-offs are. Just a couple of stories. One is... Um the proverbial case of ear infection for the kid. The doctor prescribes antibiotic. It's usually a viral infection. The doctor really isn't even treating the child, treating the anxiety of the parent. And that's gone on so much, we've probably run through 400 years of antibiotics in 40 years as a result. And it's always the latest pink medicine. Another example of what Dr. Brent James found in United Intermountain when the um, people weren't even bringing babies to term. And the NICUs were happy because they were full and just the simple process of actually determining the conception date and having a full-term baby minimized so many complications, and yet that was not 
a preferred practice and it was not done, he had to persuade his colleagues to get that done. This is astonishing. And at least my doctors are telling me with the, you can't watch a ball game now without learning about more medication than the support scores. And people are coming, it's almost a sign of respect today in the modern medical practice. If you don't hand them a script, then it's a sign you didn't really believe what they're telling you. And it's, it's amazing, uh, the transformation of medicine and the medicalization of so many things. Most psychiatric care is now pill-driven, not diagnosis-driven. So I think um, what you raise of, of getting this right, uh, the doctor does need to say no when appropriate. Not to say no to say no, but to help steer the patient in the right direction. And do, are, do we have any sort of high-level policies that can actually help that process? I mean, I'm thinking fee-for-service is part of the problem here. And Medicare is fee-for-service. You're exactly right. It's not just defensive medicine that's being practiced when doctors are afraid to say no lest they be sued having angered the patient. But also that incentive to make more money by doing more has been uh, uh, pernicious on the profession. But now, you know, most Medicaid plans are managed care. We're getting away from it. Um, but it's uh, much slower than it needs to be. Remember the time value of money. Every day that we wait is a crushing economic burden. Can you imagine um, Medicare working in some, some, some fashion similar to the way state Medicaid plans work where there is, a, there is a, a effectively a capitated plan? Well, Medicare Advantage plans are amazingly popular today. They're growing like a weed. Now, part of that is we're paying them over Medicare <laughs> fee-for-service reimbursement. But some of them are actually getting well and properly organized. And it's interesting, too, you know, you can't use Medigap insurance with Medicare Advantage plans, so we're not allowing that predatory relationship to fester because the Medicare Advantage plans were smart enough to ward off that influence. So uh, I think you're, you're slowly but surely seeing us, you know, whenever you get frustrated with America, remember what Winston Churchill said, America can always be counted on to do the right thing after she has exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> we're just in that process of running through all the alternatives right now. Well, I also tend to remember what H.L. Mencken said, which is there was no problem too difficult that a simple solution could be come up with that would be totally wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that, I'd like to open it for questions to the audience. Yes, Leah. And if you would identify yourself, that would be great. And uh, we have a mic coming. Is it working? Yeah. Uh, Leah Binder from the Leapfrog Group. The, the exchanges are about to come online. We've seen there's been some major problems with a number of states declining uh, to undertake an exchange. Uh, I'm really excited about this panel because you actually have not talked about health plans very much at all. And in the past, a lot of the discussion uh, around health reform has been really around how are we going to enable health plans to compete? How are we going to ensure the quality of health plans when, in fact, most of us really care about the quality of care delivered to us directly, which is not coming from our health plan. So now coming back to the issue of exchanges and some of the problems we're having right now, how would you like to see transparency in the health exchanges? And do you think anything needs to be changed about the plan going forward for undertaking the exchanges? Um, I'd like Marty to, to catch that one first, and then let's go from there. Well, my biggest fear is that people don't have much of a choice right now with their health plan. They work for an employer, their employer gives them basically one option, and if they don't like that option, then it's, uh, you're really inconveniencing us and we got to go out of our way and here's a plan that's more expensive and we can't even tell you what it's about. Last year, uh, there were a record number of hospital mergers and acquisitions. When the hospital is providing the insurance company, I think we've got to ask ourselves, do we have institutions that are too big to fail? In Pittsburgh, they are, there's essentially one giant insurer of that area, and when they uh, had an issue with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, all of a sudden you had 200,000 people who were going to be out of, no longer be able to get care where they were going to, where they've been getting their mm -hmm. care. So um, that's my biggest concern with the choices that patients have is that as people are afraid of some of the things that might happen in the future, uh, given the cost crisis, they're just teaming up and we're forming these giant conglomerates. You know, the exchanges have been needlessly politicized. Uh, they're based on the 
federal employee shopping method that's worked great for both parties for 40 years. If there's one thing we can agree on in healthcare, it's the relative success of FVHBP. And when even a state like Utah on its own chose to adopt an exchange years ago, that's kind of a sign that this isn't a crazy leftist idea. These are all private sector options. But now in this environment, after the Supreme Court decision, people want a reason to complain about something. So some governors have stuck their chests out and tried to make this an issue. That's so disappointing because in the name of states' rights, they're actually defeating states' rights. How does that work? Now, I think as a practical matter, we don't really know today the difference between a state-run exchange and a federally-run exchange. It's possible that there's very little difference at all because my guess is that any legitimate private sector insurer will want on the menu whoever is putting together the menu. And the subsidies are going to be basically the same. And so what's the big difference? Now, I would like to have more state skin in the game, more state acknowledgement of responsibility that the health and safety of their own residents is an important issue. But now it's politically popular in some areas of the country to deny that. But you even have a, a Mississippi that's stepping up. You know, hopefully other states will step up. Anyone else? I just have a question for you I, uh, regarding the politics. I've been a bit puzzled by it because the more states that opt out, the larger the federal footprint and the more likely you'll have uniform standards over a much larger area. And that's a form of centralization that I thought was the opposite of what folks wanted. Yeah, but see, you're from Massachusetts. Like, what, what, do you know? <laughs> what do you know about the way we think down south? You know, it's a, a crazy thing. The Economist and the Wall Street Journal have had articles showing that the states that are actually subsidized the most by the federal government are the ones most resentful of federal help. You know, if this is human nature, uh, people like to bite the hand that's feeding them. One, just Please. from a pragmatic standpoint, we've already seen with Massachusetts where cost was really kind of the kind of modality for transparency, and in, and in uh, the recent guidance around exchanges, uh, certainly you'll still see that as the trend. Uh, in order to avoid kind of a race to the bottom where plans are just trying to price themselves, you know, waiting to see who the early entry into the exchange are, what their pricing might be, and then just underprice them, I think there has to be some aspect of pairing kind of cost and quality or at least and, and some basic health literacy in how to choose a plan. So Massachusetts did a great job, had a lower, they had a, a fewer number of bodies that were uninsured but really used a lot of creative techniques. So I think that uh, adding into what we saw in Massachusetts and with Utah's experience with the exchange, kind of some robust way to help show patients, you know, there may be reasons you pick a higher cost plan because of fill in the blank. And there may be reasons to pick, you know, the, the cheapest plan in your market. And here's what you should know about that. And I'm, I'm not sure in any of the CSIO guide, you know, in any of the guidance from a policy perspective, you're not going to see that level of attention and detail. But I think it's groups like yours and a number of us in the room that are going to have to say, you know, let's absolutely make sure that as people are out there and just thrown into a marketplace, which they probably don't understand, they understand how to be kind of savvy shoppers and what that means in the, in the health insurance arena. I have a question. Isn't but but even with the exchanges, are we really going to understand what the quality of the care is that's going to be delivered by the different providers? Really, the exchanges are telling you about the insurance coverage, but are they going to tell you anything about the kind of care you're going to get? Are you going to be able to get shared decision making if you go to X hospital or Y hospital or X doctor or Y doctor? Um, and so, so. I'm not sure that the exchanges are going to start putting the kind of pressure on the on the providers that they need to that that insurers need to put on providers, so that payers need to put on providers to get them to start delivering better care for for more efficiently for lower lower cost. Well, you're right, Shannon. We've got a long way to go, but the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and this is that step. Yep. Good. Questions. Phil, have Thank you got any comments? I'd like, the, if, you, if you have anything, Phil, I'd love to hear from you. And it's Best Care Anywhere uh, is his book about the VA. Yes, yes. Uh, since Phil won't uh, oh, could you identify yourself? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm going to get you I'm going to get you next. I didn't see you. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Annabelle Fisher. I'm a professionally trained, licensed clinical social worker, born and raised in Baltimore. 
very familiar with Hopkins, worked at Hopkins and Mass General prior to getting my master's degree. Do not understand why people go to Hopkins because they can find parking. There is no parking <laughs> at Hopkins. No, there's well, a new building now. <laughs> there never was, there isn't today. So um, that really kind of blew me away. You know, you go to Hopkins because it's so well known, like you go to Mass General. And if I had to pick my choice between the right way and the best way, I picked the general over Hopkins. But anyway, let me get to my question. Uh, I love the working as the general. Uh, Hopkins has it saying. Uh, first of all, I want to address two issues. One, the, uh, with regard to the Affordable Care Act, Representative Cooper, and it has been raised here, is you did not address tort reform. And so patients come to docs and they ask for this test and that test and whatever. And until there's some kind of tort reform, and I can't write scripts, and I've done everything but a private practice, including working with the military. So when they come in and see these ads on TVs for, for psych meds, hey, you know, after a couple of times, I've got to refer you to the psychiatrist to evaluate whether you need a drug or a, if you're going to an internist, a test. And I heard this when I lived in Seattle, too. Um, group health is Virginia Mason's good. So you put, didn't put in tort reform, and can you get that in there? Because I think this is a real problem. We do need some changes in health care. I'm on Medicare now. So to Representative Cooper, I have with me a denial from Medicare. They approved the needle, but denied the medication to go into the needle. This is absurd. For those of us working in health care, we are not surprised. Yes, we're absurd. So Medicare isn't that great. To Dr. Markey and Dr. Sani and Dr. Patel, I ask you, what about alternative medicine? What's wrong with that? A lot of docs are really fighting it, but it can be good health care or working in conjunction with alternative treatments and then the issue of confidentiality, especially in mental health, if you're going to have to put everything online. I will tell you, most mental health professionals are charting. Is you going to charge me if I were in private practice? I don't think so. So tort reform, um, Hopkins, yeah, you're good at Hopkins, but alternative medicine and um, the issue of, of changing that, because we're always going to have a group of people we have to take care of, and it just came out in the post. Uh, the president is now at, so not I'm eliminating gonna, I, the Medicaid money. So let's, let's, oh, let's, let's stick yeah. to two questions yeah. to start, because we start to forget the third and the fourth. Um, Thank you. And then, uh, Representative Cooper, if you want to get my Medicare thing, th any reporter here, anybody wants to do a story? <laughs> uh, this is absurd. Absurd. <laughs> Approve a needle and not the medication. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So First of all, on uh, tort reform, I did mention malpractice reform, which is the same thing. And then in response to Shannon's question on just say no, I mentioned defensive medicine, which is another way of talking about it. It's a necessary uh, element of reform needs to be done. I mentioned it twice. Perhaps it was my southern accent. On your personal <laughs> situation under federal law, I'm not allowed to think about it until I get a Privacy Act form signed by you. So that's the way the rules work on that. Yeah. So uh, Dr. McCarry and Dr. Dr. Sani. You know, I made a m mistake the other day, or our hospital made a mistake. We ordered a CAT scan. It ended up getting done on the wrong patient. And, I, of course, I was worried they're going to come sue me. So I ran over to the patient's bedside, and I said, you know, you were supposed to get a CAT scan today. It didn't happen. I'm going to make sure personally that it gets done before the end of the day. I went over to the other patient's room, and I said, you know, you had a CAT scan today. You maybe didn't know what was going on. It was a mistake. It was intended for somebody else. I'm happy to share the results with you if you like. Now, both patients looked at me and said, thank you. I really appreciate the honesty. Nobody was angry. People are thirsty for simple honesty in healthcare. That's what they want. And if we can be honest with people, We'll see that the satisfaction, the trust, we'll, we'll see that divide be bridged, and we'll see the tort reform problem be addressed without even trying. Tort reform uh, is, I, I support it. I think it's a critical element. But here's why it's a critical element, to remove the issue off the table, and that's about it. Um, I think most people who have looked at this acknowledge that uh, most cases that should lead to a lawsuit don't. And most cases that lead to a lawsuit really shouldn't have. So there's a big disconnect there. It's also true that 
you know, honest, open communication is really the best antidote. <coughs> Just as an aside, at the Lown Group, we've been practicing a very conservative style of cardiology for 40 years. And in the management of coronary disease, we've not had a single lawsuit. So it's very much about, you know, how you uh, engage in that encounter and, and how you uh, pursue it. I have a simple, simple-minded simple question. Is tort reform something that the states have to do, or is it something that the federal government can do? Traditionally, tort reform is a state matter, but this is one of these um, backflips when conservatives want a national centralized big government solution because they want all those state laws overridden. Uh, but under traditional federalism, it's all state by state. One of the problems is that in the states that have passed tort reform, we haven't seen the kinds of, we haven't seen necessarily a drop in defensive medicine, which is one of the arguments for having tort reform. And I'm not sure that the kind of tort reform that we have so far enacted really, really addresses the problem that Dr. Sani talks about, which is that the people who were legitimately harmed do not get compensation. And in fact, it may not do the other piece of, of um, what, what, def what uh, malpractice is supposed to be able to do, which is to pull out bad doctors and either retrain them or get them out of practice. So it's not doing the two things that it's supposed to do. And I'm not sure that, um, that we have a very good model out there yet for what would. It's been such an emotional topic. It's been hard for policymakers to be rational about it. But uh, Dr. Sandy's right, uh, probably need more claims, but smaller uh, payouts, and then less friction, less fewer transaction costs in the system. And in Massachusetts, uh, there's a move to adopt the so-called Michigan model, which some of you may know about. But if essentially, when an error or, or uh, an outcome, an unexpected outcome takes place that is related to error, uh, there's an immediate apology. There's a, a very rapid resolution, potentially with uh, some financial compensation. And in that arrangement, satisfaction rates are very high in the actual, you know, with the option of going to a lawsuit remains, but actually pursuing a lawsuit drops radically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes called the I'm sorry model. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Next question. Um, yes. I, I, I have a little volume. I don't think I need it. Just for <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Cooper. I'm with uh, Project 76. I'm taking up on... Uh, uh, Dr. Patel's um, mention of Longman, who was sitting right here, his work uh, in context of the exchange question that was raised. It seems to me the, I shouldn't say simple, but the available solution for addressing many of these problems, particularly from a finance point of view uh, is centralization. The premise of his book was to associate every nonprofit provider in the country into one entity. Community hospitals, medical schools, 10,000 community centers, um, and to use the leverage of that collective to move beyond the provider leg of that table to the supply leg, to the information technology leg, um, to the insurance leg. And instead of being on the defensive, which is David K. Johnson's, Johnston's a critique of the good guys in the healthcare delivery system reform movement being on the defensive. Uh, uh, his suggestion is that you go on the offensive. The, what the forces who oppose reasonable reform of healthcare delivery systems such that they cut cost and not care to patients. What they fear most is 
the impossible a public option in the government where they could exercise influence to gum up the works and where their minions could um, unfavorably influence the whole. But they would run toward that if they faced in the private not-for-profit sector a virtual single payer system that using this man's book for providers, adding the elements of IT, insurance, supply, uh, et cetera. Um, from a finance point of view, the revenue from Medicaid that's being uh, refused, the revenue from the exchange movement that's being refused, the ordinary cash flow from Medicare, et cetera, if all of that revenue were channeled through this nationwide not-for-profit health service represented by this guy's book, uh, Providers for Starters, you'd have the leverage necessary to convince the politicians and industry that their safest option is a public option instead of this truly competitive behemoth you could create in the private nonprofit sector. Can I, can I compress that into, into a, a way of, of, um, uh, for, the, for the panel to respond to? I think what you're saying is, is the VA for all a viable possibility is, or Medicare for all with, uh, with in effect, you can, you can choose which system you go to. Are those A, viable, and B, would they be better systems? From the private sector, yes. You could do that from the private, not the private sector. Let, let, I'm gonna let the, I wanna let the panel just, uh, respond here. I have two reactions. Um, in Boston, we can't get two hospitals across the street talking to each other, <laughs> and I'm sure we're not alone. So I think there's a real problem of how you would work that just sort of culturally. The second issue is really maybe more legal, and I'm certainly no lawyer, but um, you know, in Massachusetts, with the, with the health care law we have, uh, thank you, Governor Romney, um, that there is a there are some problems, and, and one of them is that small businesses actually cannot band together to create the kind of scale and bulk and market power that I think is part of what you're advocating. I, I certainly think lar more leverage on the part of various actors in the system could help rationalize the negotiations, but the negotiations will always still be pretty tough. We are coming on that. Uh, actually, I'd like to let, let panelists. One way you're already seeing, I mean, there are certainly legal issues withstanding so that even in a non-for-profit setting, kind of an aggregation of force of providers that could be used to do exactly what I know the insurer and the UPMC situation kind of modeled out. That would be one problem. But you're already seeing something akin to what you're describing by the states that are going forward with exchanges, having their Medicaid plan be part of the exchange option. So if you think about it, what we're already doing, even in this kind of kind of incremental way, but in 50 states, even one state like California doing something like that has huge effects on the market. You can see a situation where a Medicaid plan, which largely would have had vulnerable kind of FQHCs, and that's what their provider base is, potentially be competitive, certainly like Commonwealth Care is in Massachusetts. You can argue about how competitive it is or whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing. But I think what you're describing and Shannon's question of Medicare for all or a VA for all, I think we're taking that apart in pieces through both the exchanges as well as through the Medicaid expansion. We've been spending a lot of time talking about exchanges, 
Medicaid will outnumber people enrolled in Medicaid will outnumber people enrolled in Medicare as a result of the expansion and kind of the growing population to childless adults. So, which I hate that term, but that's how we think about <laughs> childless adults. But it's 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 a very it's so I actually think what you're describing and what Phil has written about is a lot further within reach, which is what scares people in some, anything that powerful and dramatic can be just as frightening. And I think that's why you see some of this verbal and physical opposition to it. But I, th I think the, f the next 10 years are gonna be a fascinating time in terms of moving towards something like you're describing. And it sounds like it's actually threatening to the, the provider right. industry. Right, correct. Because what it means correct. is lower revenue. Exactly, because again, going to this kind of how do we do things with less money, less resources, and oh, wait a minute, then we're exposing what kind of, you know, maybe fat or excess there was in a system. Yeah. One final comment. Brief. Brief. Mike. On the question of antitrust and such, there, there are the incentives of finance. For example, a collective group could offer uniform, de facto, standardized electronic medical records and nationwide health information mm -hmm. database yes. to providers on a cost-free basis, including software and equipment, if there was a un unified effort. You could literally take the health information component, financial component, out of the budget of not-for-profit providers. That's one incentive. That's not forcing people together, that's drawing separate enterprises together. Secondly, on the question of savings, um, procurement. Economies of scale matter. If you're buying for every Medicare entity, every Medicaid patient, every um, private patient participating in an exchange to access this system, um, you have the leverage to reduce the cost of supply and equipment for healthcare delivery significantly. Um, you could be talking two or three hundred billion dollars a year. That's not chump change. Now, so the, the advantage of the collective is too big a plus to be sidelined and Brookings, New America, and the Center for American Progress should be sitting down, putting your heads together with Dr. Berwick, who, this is his approach. This is what he would do if he could. Now, we know New America has the expertise. We've seen it here, we've seen it there. Dr. Capet, I know she has the expertise. That's Brookings. Center for American Progress, they have, uh, I think you've given us. I think you've yeah, given okay. us enough to work for, okay. for from yeah. at this point. So, so I think the point is very interesting. So, um, when a hospital finds a way to reduce the price, say, of a knee replacement, does it pass that savings along to its customers, who are really its patients? Probably not. It saves that. It saves that savings, and that's, and that's an increasing. I think that's going to be an increasingly important issue here: is who gets to keep the money, as hospitals, for example, become more efficient, as large entities start to be able to bring down the price of things that right now, frankly, are hugely overpriced, considering the value that they offer patients. Who gets that money back? Right now, we don't have a system that basically shares that with the community that's ultimately paying for the health care. Any comments? Uh, at the risk of uh, being accused of, of advocating f for a return to the cottage industry mentality, I guess, you know, as a, as a practitioner, 
it's deep in my heart, <laughs> the cottage industry mentality. Uh, I'm, I'm troubled by some of the scale we're seeing. I'm troubled by the fact that increasingly physicians are being employed, you know, in large hospital systems and networks, and I'm, I'm concerned about unintended consequences. So we're currently, you know, the healthcare market, more, I suppose, in New England and Massachusetts than elsewhere, but it's a very schizophrenic market. We have a, a real impulse towards global payments, uh, both in the private sector with, with the Blues uh, AQ, Alternate Quality Care Contract, which is a form of global payment, as well as the moves legislatively and otherwise. But a whole bunch of revenue remains in a fee-for-service model. And, it, and, and in some ways, hospital systems themselves are living this kind of schizophrenic existence because you know, while there's a lot of potential in ACOs, I mean, I saw, I mean, I, I founded and, and ran a uh, primary care risk-bearing network in the 90s, and I, I've seen that movie, and there's certain limits to where you go until you get into the guts of how the system works and really transform it. Uh, and that's a slow process. But meanwhile, the bulking up for ACOs is leading to intended or unintended major market power in these marketplaces. And the fee-for-service side of the business is suddenly subject to forces that are not so good. So scale is a, is a complicated issue, at least from where I sit. So um, I'm, I want to end um, uh, a little bit early. but So I'm going to go to Caroline and then to Paul. And oh, we have one more. All right. And maybe we won't end, end early. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. I'm also an attorney. Um, I want to follow up on something you've all sort of touched on that goes to the, the story that Dr. McCary talked about at the beginning, the person who chose Hopkins because of the parking. Um, in, in the future of, Medicare, of medical care in this country, uh, consumers are not going to have very many choices. Um, uh, the way insurers try to save money is to have networks and to restrict uh, the patients to those networks or they pay a very high premium to get out. Um, and we have doctors uh, now working for ACOs that are very large. If you want patients to engage in shared decision making and you spend the, t the time it takes to talk someone out of a procedure, like a PSA for instance, um, they will not trust doctors who they feel have several masters. Um, if they think that you're recommending against a PSA because you're trying to save money for the hospital or save money for the insurance company or you're trying to better your profile, uh, they will be concerned. And if you recommend against a PSA and uh, they uh, get prostate cancer, uh, you're screwed. And so is the hospital. Um, and that's happened. There was a federal case about it. Uh, so I think you have to factor that in. Uh, the, 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 without the trust, um, the cottage industry part of medicine, uh, it just doesn't work. I think that, here, here. that yeah, I think the, your comment stands for itself. Paul? Hi, Paul Hewitt with the Council for Affordable Health Coverage. Um, Shannon, you opened the discussion today with a, an anecdote about a uh, trillion dollars in debt uh, out there in the hospital sector uh, and the need to downsize capacity to deliver care more efficiently. It sounds like that's a money losing proposition and I know that the bond markets want to hold hospitals accountable for paying that debt. And more recently, I think we've seen some evidence that there's a lot, it's triggering a lot of cost shifting. Um, S&P recently released an update uh, of its health care cost indices and it found, for example, that the professional commercial uh, cost index in the health sector uh, rose by 8.5% uh, in the 12 months through September, whereas Medicare went up 1.5%. So we're seeing a growing gap between public and private costs. So as Medicare uh, and, and other payers seek to hold hospitals accountable for their um, excess volume, uh, avoidable uh, emergencies and so forth, uh, it's, reducing, it's reducing revenues 
And hospitals have uh, found a way in the current context to uh, um, raise prices uh, exorbitantly on private payers. So we're talking about really two parallel universes. My question here is how do we create accountability on pricing on the private side? Accountability on pricing on the private side, that is a good question. I thought that's what the magic of the marketplace was for. <laughs> I just want to make one comment. We have um, two of my research staff here with us. One's a medical student, the other's a surgical resident, spending a year out of their training just working on quality and safety. We're seeing more and more students and residents saying now that they recognize overtreatment and mistakes can harm as many people as we can save with surgery. That's amazing. One of the projects is looking at how many registries we have in healthcare. There are 200 registries. Only three make their data available to the public, even though the majority are taxpayer funded. If people had access to this information, I think you would see hospitals scrambling to be more transparent and um, trying to have better outcomes, providing better value for their business. If you have a private insurance, if you call my office and say, I need a pancreas transplant, we say, what insurance company do you have? Oh, I've got a private, blah, blah, blah. Then we say, oh, you got to go through financial clearance. They go through fighting. If you say, I'm um, 67, I have Medicare. Well, great. Just call us when you're in the parking lot, and we'll see you down there. It's, it, there is a, a competition for patients, and um, I think people just need good information. What do you think, Paul? Is good information going to be enough? Probably, my, my guess is that we're going to need some sort of uh, mechanism for better price discipline on the private side um, that matches something that we have on the Medicare side. But if we just uh, tamp down on Medicare costs, we're going to result in a ballooning of, of private costs that eventually creates access problems for beneficiaries. So do you see that as having a legislative solution, a regulatory solution, a state level solution, a federal solution? I mean, what are the, what are the possible, what's the range of possibility here to start to? Right, well, uh, there are a number of, of administrative solutions you could uh, pursue at the state or the federal levels. Some have suggested all payer where there's no price discrimination at all. Everybody pays the same price and it's negotiated once a year. My sense is it might be most effective handled at the local level, but um, if to the extent that, that market concentration, and you have a situation where 90% of hospital markets are highly concentrated according to FTC standards, where that frustrates real price discipline. Um, we, have, we have mechanisms, everything from utilities to uh, antitrust to deal with that kind of issue. All right, we have last question. You have the, the ultimate question. Hi, I'm Susan Huffless. I am a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. I'm not a healthcare provider. And it seems like there's this underlying trend that there's a disconnect between the patients and the provider and what information they use to make healthcare choices. There also seems to be this hint that the solution is education for the patients. And if only the patient could be more educated, there would be a solution here. I wonder if there's something that the physicians could do to help close that gap. And if you guys agree that that should happen, I, I'm also a little concerned that the answer might be that physicians just need to be more honest. And if that's so, how do we educate physicians to be more honest? Uh, I, I don't think the answer is just patients need to be better educated, putting some sort of burden of proof on them. I, I hope that's not how at least I, th I don't think any of us were saying this needs to be, you know, patient. I think if anything, it's that there needs to be transparency because it does two things. It helps to, first of all, give information and have it out there, whether patients use it or families, whomever needs to use it, researchers such as yourself, as well as it puts a little bit of fire under, especially doctors. We know doctors respond very well 
when things are posted and you're compared across each other and the practice and people say, well, how come you were so bad at giving pap smears to your patients this year? What was it about how, you know, what you're doing that makes you so bad at this? And that's certainly an incentive that physicians in particular respond to time and time again. In terms of getting doctors to be more honest, I mean, I think Marty was born this way. I think he's always going to be this way. I don't think it matters where he works or what he does or whether he became a surgeon. I think that in some level we're imprinted upon just the way we've, you know, whether you, you believe this kind of philosophy or not. I think we practice in many ways based upon our own just kind of personalities and attitudes. Jerome Groupman writes about this all the time, that so much of it is just subjective based on how we think. So I think what has to happen is not necessarily, you know, let's just tell all doctors to be more honest, but it's got to be kind of multi-pronged. Professions need to own back their people. We need to, we're no longer really a society, physicians don't really have a, we don't really have a professional kind of cohesion amongst ourselves. We're all out there on our own for most part. We need to kind of come back as a professional practice. We need policies such as kind of the things that we've already talked about around tort reforms and helping to put things down so that doctors feel like they can say no and that they're not going to immediately have somebody calling somebody, even if that's just a false mental belief. We need some way of having that. And then third, we need to have cross-specialty communication. It's very rare that I can get my surgical and cardiology colleagues to actually return any of my calls or interact with me about any of my patients. So we need to have a little bit more humanism just amongst ourselves. And that's, that's at least a better place to start than just give patients more information. Great. Well, on that note, I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll end. And I want to um, thank all of my panelists here.